issue was that these protests represented profound loss of trust amongst the most vulnerable. If I have to call out in crisis for help and I worry that those who respond will worsen the situation, where can I call out for crisis? Now, coming out of a pandemic, as I hope we soon will, we're presented with choices. Will we try to go back to a society that we had before? Or will we try to move forward to create democracies worthy of vulnerable people's trust? Should we fail to earn that trust, history is clear that the next rebuilding effort will be built from the ashes of what we have failed to do. The question then is whose job is it to do this trust building? Well, in my field, activists have a saying that change only moves at the speed of trust and trust begins by showing up. So while I would very much like for all of us to take equal measure of leadership in rebuilding trust, the leaders will be those who show up. Today, we are privileged to honor a new cohort of people who will show up and build trust. People who will lead in those efforts. So as we gather to do that, it is my great honor to welcome you to this session honoring Schwab Social Entrepreneur Awardees. And before we honor them and hear their stories, it is my intense privilege to introduce the woman most responsible for assembling this transformative community of trust earners, Mrs. Hilda Schwab. Please join me in welcoming Hilda Schwab. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a very moving moment because I have been waiting for this for, mm -hmm. uh, as you did, for more than two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the awardees of 2019, 20, no, 2020, 20, now 21, 22, we have mm -hmm. never seen you in person. Huh. It's on the screen, um, which was, it was good enough, but uh, um, I'm really excited to see you all here now in, in person uh, and to listen to your stories and to have a new cohort of awardees among us and also some of the very, very first cohort in uh, 2002 or 2003. The two Egyptians in any case, I know, and the others, uh, yeah, three more, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> so it's great to be all together. And um, I also would like to uh, greet our foundation board members, Helen Schmidt and Ruth Soubi, as well as our guests of honor, Richard Edelman and Jean-Philippe Courtois. Wonderful to have you here. So I'm delighted also to welcome you, welcome you all at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting 2020, but also to the Schwab Foundation meeting, Transforming Through Trust. For 20 years now, the Schwab Foundation has supported the world's leading social entrepreneurs in their efforts to create a more just, a more equitable, and a more sustainable world. Mm -hmm. I'm proud that we have over 400 social entrepreneurs uh, along with social entrepreneurs and private and public entrepreneurs and thought leaders who are engaged in our activities. Today, we are delighted to welcome our latest group of awardees to our community. The social innovators of the year 2022 are finding systemic solutions to the world's most pressing problems. It, it goes from hip, being hip hop to transform the lives of favela dwellers in Brazil, to unlocking ancient storytelling through augmented reality in Australia, as we just had the demonstration uh, one hour ago here. And there are some incredible statistics. Um, the awardees from 2019 to 22 have collectively had an impact on 100 million people around the world succeeding in overcoming persistent and systemic barriers, and you all have the Amazing. impact report in your uh, chair. Our entire community had a combined impact on a total of 722 million lives that have been directly improved by their work in concentrating on inclusivity, collaboration, and sustainability. Our world is in dire need of healing and rebuilding trust while it also needs us to transform our economic, societal, and planetary systems. Both the individual and collective work of social innovators 
and we were talking uh, on Monday and uh, Saturday night, we talked about our collective action and collective work that we have to do. So it helps us to recognize that change towards a better future is not only possible, but it is already on the way. So please join me in congratulating the social innovators of the year 2022, and we will hear from them more. Nurses, doctors, scientists, healthcare providers have been the heroes of the past two years, bending the accumulated wisdom of our species towards our most pressing common goal. But what happens if our healthcare systems treat us differently because of our identities, our resources? What happens when they diminish the wisdom of our elders or our ancestors? Where do we have our trust for the next pandemic? This first group of social entrepreneurs is working to fix that. Please join me in welcoming them. Yes. I'm Jos de Blok. I'm Jos de Blok, and I'm a nurse, and I'm proud of that. In 2005, I decided to start a social enterprise called Buurtzorg, because I was fed up with the bureaucracy and as a nurse, you want to take care for people based on your professional ethics. We started with one team in 2006. And we decided that we build an organization based on self-organization, without a management structure, without policies, just taking care for patients in neighborhoods. So we built teams all around Holland. It started with one, and 15,000 people followed. They stood up in their neighborhood. They searched for their friends and they said, we will start our own team. We took care for more than one million people in the last few years. And we fo there followed a lot of nurses in other countries. We are now working with uh, people in 30 countries, partners, and 10,000 of nurses in different countries all over the world, based on a simple principle, trust. Trust the nurses and trust on their professional ethics. And if you do so, the costs will go down. We showed that we uh, decrease the cost with 40%. So we spend a lot of money we don't need to spend, and we should spend it on patients and not on bureaucracy. So I'm proud that I'm here and that we are awarded with this uh, Social Innovation Award, and this award is for all the nurses in the world. Thank you. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Adriana, and I am, I think I am a lucky doctor. I will give you three reasons to believe me. First of all, it's the f best moment for a doctor to speak in an economic forum. At this moment, we all know the impact health can have in the economy. Second, I'm here representing the health organization I founded with my wife, Sabine. In SIS Brazil, new and now work together promoting health equity. We are using teleultrasound to provide the best care to pregnant women in remote areas. With telehealth booths, we are bringing mental health care to people in vulnerable communities. By putting intention and action together, our team, sponsors, and volunteers are building trust and driving change. Finally, I am a lucky physician because I'm here sharing this work with you. We already know that making healthcare accessible for more people is the best way to save lives and to save money too. It's not about charity, it's about strategy. This is a possible, possible dream. We know how to do it. And I know that if we work together, we can make it real to the entire world. Thank you. One of my favorite passages in the King James Bible is Proverbs 29, 18. It says, <clears throat> it's translated as, where there is no vision, the people perish. It's one of my favorite verses because it's allegedly a mistranslation. The Hebrew word para is mistranslated to perish, but it actually means to be shaken loose. Where there is no vision, the people are shaken loose. 
When there is no vision for how our communities live together, the people and the communities are shaken loose. This next group is, is doing work to make sure that there is vision so our people hang together. Please join me in welcoming them. Hi, my name is Ashraf Patel, and I am representing Prava, Community the Youth Collective, and Bharta Leap Coalition. The world is facing tremendous challenges of inequality, conflict, and ecological decline. We need ownership of the commons at a tremendous scale. But where is this leadership going to come from? We work on building youth leadership at scale with soul through compelling self to society journeys. Our mission is every youth a jagrik and every space nurturing jagriks, where the jagrik is a self-awakened active citizen who inspires others. We have seen in our work through our experience, young people once trusted and part of key and significant intergenerational decision-making and dialogue spaces not only bring alternative perspectives, can help us challenge together the status quo, bring out new innovations, entrepreneurship, and spur tremendous social change action by being the change they want to see in the world. I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank the Shop Foundation to rec recognize this mission. Uh, Catalyst 2030 for the solidarities. And I look forward to going away from this forum with greater solidarity, solidarities, greater commitment, and tremendous collaborative partnerships that are needed for us to work across all sectors, across all countries, to create the space, co-create the space with young people for building youth leadership, spaces that nourish love, learning, freedom, ownership, and social hope. Thank you so much. Salve, salve, meus comadres, salve, salve, meus compadres. Vamos com tudo que o bagulho é nós. Tamo junto. Good evening. My name is Celso Ataíde. I come from a place which is a symbol of exclusion in Brazil. I come from a, a favela called in Sapo, Rio de Janeiro. My parents were alcoholics, and my mother and I lived on the street for six years. This personal tragedy showed me the importance of being an entrepreneur to survive. I then gave my life to entrepreneurship at base, as the base of the social pyramid. 17 million people live in favelas in Brazil, twice the, po the population of Switzerland. These 17 million people do not have access to basic services. Favelas are filled with resilience and joy. In fact, favelas are not space of need by of power and trust. Together, we built the largest organization representing favelas in Brazil, CUFA. We also built favela holding we group of 24 social companies. The agenda of entrepreneurship in favelas is urgent, not only in Brazil. Attention. The world must choose either we share the wealth produced by favelas or we will share the consequences with social exclusion produced by global elites. Thank you. I am not Kennedy Udede, from um, giving voices to children on the streets 
uh, himself being a homeless child to making sure that the voiceless have a voice. Kennedy Odede is a world-class social entrepreneur. I'm not him. He's getting some well-deserved rest today as he's ill, but wanted to take this moment to acknowledge him. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Greetings. Hello. I am Pranshu Singhar. I am the founder of an organization, Karo Sambhav. Karo Sambhav translates to make it possible. We were set up in 2017 with the broad objective of making circular economy possible. We started our work with electronic waste, but then gradually added our work in the space of uh, plastics packaging, glass, and now batteries. To do this work, what we start with is fundamentally set up of collection systems. Collection systems at a grassroots level so that people like me and you can participate. We can give away dead products that have been generated. Once we have collected, we start working on the recycling systems and finally the reutilization systems so that this material can go back in the economy. Since 2017, Karosambhav has worked in over 100 cities and has collected over 30,000 tons of various types of waste. To build this well-governed system, we partner with businesses primarily, civil society organizations, informal sector, because that's where uh, the big challenge is, and with international agencies. People will queue up for participation, and you see that here, if they are provided a solution, if they are given an ability to participate. I'm standing here in, on behalf of multiple actors in the space of circular economy and with the objective of requesting businesses to fund these systems in a fair way. Today, these costs are not accounted in the products when they are being sold, and that causes significant stress in these systems. We need to create the other half of our economy, and I'm People are waiting for this to be done, and we trust that businesses will come forward to make it happen. Thank you. The genius of our children cannot even be bounded by our limited visions for them. But if we do not give them the spaces to imagine worlds beyond our own failures, we risk them losing connection to the wisdom of our ancestors and having to learn from our injuries as if anew. The next group of inspiring change makers is working to keep that trust alive in our children. Please join me in welcoming them. Our world is in need of healing, rebuilding trust, and hope. My name is Renee Parker. I'm the CEO of R Labs, a social enterprise that's birthed on the Cape Flats, and that's in Cape Town, South Africa. We live in a world that's filled with endless challenges and problems. Who best to solve these problems? Our communities, they are the problem experts. They have a deep understanding of the problems and challenges that we are all trying to solve. Undeserved communities might lack the necessary resources or an enabling environment that is built on trust. But they do not lack the will or the potential. The world's most underutilized resource is its people. Arlib's mission is to unlock the potential. Our passion is solely to create systems and enablement, enabling environments where the lives of many can be transformed and impact. And they receive empowerment. This is through transformation that occurs in their lives. And that's through training, through innovation, through technology, and of course, economic opportunities. We build the capacity in people People build the businesses and the ventures, and we help scale them. Hope not shared is not real hope. 
our labs is making hope contagious. We are honored to receive this award. Thank you so much. Warami, my name is Michaela Jade, and I am a Cabrigal woman of the Darug speaking nations of Sydney, Australia. I descend from one of the oldest living cultures on planet Earth. Our community have faced hundreds of events of climate change, of sea level rises of more than 100 metres, of being able to live on the driest continent on this planet successfully for 80,000 years. And our elders, like Uncle Don Rollins in this beautiful picture, have the cultural authority and the cultural knowledge, language and law to share what we know about the world's oldest living continuous knowledge systems around science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, otherwise known as STEAM. So why are we excluded from developing the world's newest technologies? We want to change that. And at Indigital, we work with elders to set cultural authority and to teach digital skills to the oldest people in our community, to then teach the youngest people not just the digital skills, but the cultural knowledge that goes with it. We are really proud to be able to be invested in by our cultural communities across Australia and New Zealand, and more recently in Canada. And this award, is for my community, my family, my partner and my daughters and my elders who have given up so much to be a part of this journey and to believe in something that at the start seems so impossible to achieve. We're building the metaverse and we're starting now and we're involving the world's oldest living culture in the development of the next version of the internet. Thank you. My name is Rana Dejani. I'm a professor of molecular biology and I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 is a complex situation. Most solutions are just band-aids. I want to address the root cause to catalyze systems change. I believe we can do that if every human being has the mindset of I can and feels responsible to solve locally. But how do you do that? Well, we came up with a simple approach. We train women and youth and men to read aloud in their native language to the children in their neighborhood on a regular basis as volunteers. That is the We Love Reading program. The outcomes of the program are first, that the children fall in love with reading and therefore become lifelong readers and learners. Second, the adults, mostly women, discover their voices literally and figuratively being empowered to become change makers themselves. And the community has the mindset of I can. We Love Reading started in Jordan and now has spread to 60 countries around the world. It's a social movement. It's the butterfly effect. So how did it scale? Well, first, because we have the magic sauce, the secret sauce, to motivate children and adults to do things because they want to, not because they have to, based on trust. The second thing is that uh, We Love Reading is based on shared universal values while celebrating diversity by acting locally, uh, reflecting the harmony in nature. And lastly, We Love Reading focuses on the human-human interaction that is fundamental to the development of a healthy mental, emotional, and social human being, all based on state-of-the-art research. We Love Reading is changing mindsets through reading to create change makers. Our next speaker, Richard, Richard Edelman, is the CEO of uh, Edelman, and they administer the Edelman Trust Barometer, the world's leading metric of trust in institutions. As a quantitative social scientist, I'm excited to hear from him, and we are all privileged to learn from him. Please join me in welcoming Richard Edelman. I describe this as like being at the World Cup. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> impressive, you guys. 
Okay, so we started doing the trust barometer in year 2000 because we um, had observed the battle in Seattle where NGOs stormed the World Trade Organization meeting protesting globalization. And we wondered, you know, what's the level of credibility uh, of this groups? We thought, you know, quite low. No, amazingly, they were the most trusted institution in the world and continued so for 18 years. And then two years ago, in the height of the pandemic, it was government because they had the big bazooka and they were the logical ones to take over. The shock after that, though, is business is the most trusted institution. Now, what's happened to NGOs? So I think what's happened is you guys have to learn how to fight. Why do I say this? Because you've been politicized. The right wing people are trying to delegitimize civil society. And if you don't fight back, you are going to continue to lose your position in the world. Now, I only tell you this, not like some preacher man, I tell you this with love, because my wife's a social entrepreneur, I watch what she does, and you have to fight back. You have to fight back with facts, you have to fight back with personality, because what's happened is the leadership of civil society has disappeared in terms of being important figures. When you watch the run up to Glasgow, think about it, who was being quoted? Government figures, government leaders, and business people. Where was civil society? Big mistake, except for Guterres with his big report about the state of the world, none of the important groups came forward. That's not acceptable. It's also not acceptable that you allow the shrinkage of mainstream media to define your presence. What's going on in the world is you have to make your own channels. The mainstream media is shrunk by half. That's the math. So. Stop playing the old game, play the new game. You have better ability than anybody to tell these stories. Look at who you are. So in short, you're being depositioned, you have to fight back, and I believe you can. Thank you. And we do love a fighter, thank you. Here at the World Economic Forum, we are here in part to celebrate all that business can do. Business has been the grand accelerant of collective action, innovation, and human advancement. It has also been the greatest extractor of labor and an amplifier of misery in our his history. This next group is working to maximize the good and eliminate the ev evils that business can do. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming the next group of social entrepreneurs. Yeah, 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 Pido. Paguntahe, hutashana. I come to you as a citizen of the Assiniboine Sioux Tribe from the Fort Peck Indian Reservation in northeastern Montana. Oh. I welcomed you in my, in my language to say, I uh, hope we're all here with a healthy and happy life. I would love to share you a bit of my story. I, I come to this position standing on the stage from um, a position of uh, starting my own business within a business. I was very fortunate to pitch a business model to the largest mega brand in the world, Nike, and asked them to believe in me, a humble man from a rural Indian reservation in Montana, and trust me that I was gonna take this work in the correct way, which, which launched my, my career, which is I'm the general manager and visionary of a brand at Nike called N7. Oh my gosh. N7 really is, it's really based on the fundamental foundations of we have as indigenous people that reads, in every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on seven generations. And my grandfather explained to me that I was in the middle. And I look back three generations for guidance, direction, and focus, and learn from the people who came before me, and put my life in a position where I would look forward to these generations to hopefully make a difference, or create impact, and create profound. The mission of my work today is really to inspire and enable 1.5 million indigenous youth to participate in sport and physical activity to address the health disparities in our community. Our community, our community in North America, our indigenous community in North America has been dealt some serious um, historical trauma that we're dealing with. And my thought was, what a better tool to raise up our, our self-esteem than sport. 
And so bringing sport, having Nike believe in my, my vision and support me to, to take this, we've affected the lives of, of 500,000 youth since 2009. In closing, I would like to send a personal thank you to the Swab Foundation for recognizing uh, our indigenous community on a platform where, where we have never existed. In, in the marketing world in Nike, we call it taking our stories from the margins to the mainstream. And I thank you for that. In, thank you. In closing, I would like to send a message to, to my indigenous youth that are watching me today and to my, feather, my fellow SWAB awardees. We have a saying at N7, when you see me, you see us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gisela Sanchez. I'm from Costa Rica, and I strongly believe that access to food and nutrition should be a true universal right. It is on paper, but we have to make it real. Uh, many, many people don't know that 25,000 people, including 10,000 children, die every day because of hunger. It's difficult, it's very sad, and it's uh, difficult to grasp because we're in the middle of the 21st century, and we can have, we have enough food to feed 9 billion people, and we are only 7.8 billion. And, and that is why eight years ago, uh, we created NutriVida. It's a social business in Latin America. And, uh, and we did it through a strategic alliance between FIFCO and Professor Mohamed Yunus, a Nobel Peace Laureate, to fight malnutrition. How do we do it? We provide food, highly nutritious, fortified food, uh, for the people that need it the most. And the interesting thing is that we don't give away the food. We sell it at cost. So this is a financially sustainable way, way to fight malnutrition. We have been able uh, to provide food for 2.5 million people so far, but this is nothing compared to the challenge that we're facing. Two billion people around the world suffer from heat and hunger or undernutrition, which is when people have food, but they don't have the vitamins and minerals that they need in order to live a healthy and happy life. I can tell you that I come from a very poor family in Costa Rica. I experienced undernutrition myself, so I can tell you there's nothing more important than food and love for a human being. So I hope that we can convince many of you and, and as many people as possible to join us and to make the zero hunger goal of the United Nations a reality. It is urgent, it is feasible, so we should make, make it happen together. Thank you so much. Government is quite literally the manifestation of how we choose to live together. We invest in it our voices, the care for our most vulnerable, and regulations of the rules that allow us to experience peace. When trust in government fails, we simply cannot live together. This last group is working to give us governments worthy of the best of us. Please join me in welcoming them. My name is Alberto Alemano. I'm a professor of law and also a social and political entrepreneur as the founder of The Good Lobby. Let me tell you, uh, we no longer believe in our institutions, in government, but we increasingly trust the private sector. We expect companies to fill up the void left by governments and to tackle major societal issues from climate change all the way to social justice. But how can companies do that if they continue to hijack the very same institutions that we no longer trust by pushing for their own self-interest through lobbying and political donations. Today, even the most green and social companies might be blocking the adoption of legislation, pushing for those very same causes just behind closed doors. 
Think about a company that might be citing and speaking on behalf of climate change, who all of a sudden might be a member of a trade association that is actually blocking the adoption of stricter legislative standards on the environment. Or think about a company that is citing and supporting the LGBT community at the same time paying for the political campaign of a candidate who is opposing gay rights. Today, the misalignment between what companies say and what companies lobby for is the major factor preventing advances on major societal issues. So what we can realistically expect companies to do when it comes to restore trust in our institutions? My claim today is that companies should not only become environmentally and socially responsible, but also politically responsible. What do I mean by that? I mean to do three main things which seems basic, but they are not doing it. The first one is to disclose all political spending, all lobbying, all support to think tanks and different organizations that completely change the environment that allows certain laws to be blocked or to be passed. The second thing, let's try to align what you say and what you're lobbying for. Let's make it explicit. Let's be consistent. People, investors, employees, and customers are watching on you. And the third and the last, let's make sure companies to share the attention of the policymakers. Policymakers deserve to hear more voices. They deserve to hear more interest when making their major trade-off decisions, which are difficult already, but you make this even more difficult. In other words, let me tell you, and I'm pretty sure that I get some allies in this room and hopefully out there watching us. Time has come to democratize lobbying as the privileged tool to restore faith in our democracies. Thank you. I am Adam Kahane of Rios Partners. The time we are living in demands that we work together across our deepest divides. We must collaborate even with people we do not agree with or like or trust. But how can we do this? In 2015, 45 Mexican leaders started to work together to address their country's terrible crisis of insecurity, illegality, and inequity. This photo is of the first session of their first meeting. The people seated in the circle are executives, politicians, activists, and military, religious, and indigenous leaders. You can see the discomfort they are feeling to be working together. And yet, over the past seven years, this group has gone on to make important contributions to creating a better Mexico. My colleagues and I have spent the past 30 years building a practice and theory for such radical collaboration all around the world. Here is what we have learned. It is possible to work together across our deepest divides. It is not easy or straightforward or guaranteed, but it can be done. And it must be done. There is no other way to address the challenges of our time. Thank you. Hi. My name is Hari Han, and I'm a professor of political science and the director of the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. The SNF Agora Institute is an institute that is dedicated to realizing the promise of the ancient Agora in modern times. We work by providing nonpartisan, evidence-based solutions for strengthening the global Agora and thereby strengthening democracy. Why focus on democracy? Because democracy at its core is most fundamentally a system in which people learn to work together to solve our problems. But right now, democracy is under threat all over the world. 
Consider our stickiest social problems, building a sustainable world, solving problems of inequality, creating the stability that we need for our economies to thrive. All of those problems depend on multi-stakeholder solutions to be able to solve them. Yet entering into those kind of partnerships requires a leap of faith. I have to be able to say, I may not get my way, but I'm willing to try because I know that we are stronger together than acting alone. And people are much less willing to take that leap of faith when they don't trust each other. At the SNF Agora Institute, we partner with NGOs, with companies, with governments to try to understand how we can make that leap of faith more possible. We work by trying to um, transform scholarly insights into usable knowledge. And in the end, we imagine a world with people at the center, grounded in their own interest, connected to each other through relationship with their hands on the levers of change. And we believe that we can use data and evidence to try to make that possible. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Sanjay Pradhan. This Ukrainian monument of independence symbolizes how democracy is under assault globally, burning from outside attacks, but also internally from plummeting citizen trust in government. This has fueled a global rise of authoritarian leaders and 15 consecutive years of democratic backsliding across countries mm -hmm. where, get this, a staggering two-thirds of our world's population now live. But this monument also symbolizes how courageous Ukrainians are fighting back as our courageous reformers inside and outside government across our 77 country open government partnership are fighting to advance reforms that renew democracy. In Ukraine, reformers were disclosing opaque, previously opaque contracts captured by oligarchs, siphoning public funds. In Slovakia and the UK, reformers are ending anonymous companies that are propping up autocrats, oligarchs. In Colombia, reformers are empowering people to track billions in COVID spending through a mobile app to ensure they reach the most vulnerable. The award I receive today truly belongs to these reformers. It's not sufficient for the West to only unite against Russia. They must also unite to renew democracy at home and globally. I have come to Davos to call on more governments, businesses, and civil society to join our coalition of brave reformers in scaling up these transformative reforms to renew democracy in forging a countervailing force against authoritarianism. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't sure he was going to do it, but he did it. <laughs> you go, Sanjay. In black activist circles, where I grew up, where I do my work now, we have a saying that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but often furthest from the resources necessary to make that possible. Today, we have heard from the bridge between the problems and the resources, the people who will ferry over what is needed to the people who know how to do. It's inspiring, it's humbling. I wanna thank you, thank you Richard Edelman, thank you Mr. Schwab, but mostly thank them.